and here we go. Okay, so um, today, chapter 25, um, it's about functions. So this chapter, I'm gonna be honest with you, I really like the way it was structured. Um, I've always, I thought that I wasn't that good at functions, but apparently maybe I am, and I was just um, thinking that I wasn't that good. But the way the chapter is structured, it's um, it's very easy to then recall or remember the different parts because when you hear functions, honestly, it's very um, what I'm looking for. It can be very intimidating, and you're like, oh my gosh, functions! How am I gonna write this right? But it's the way the chapter is structured; it makes it very easy to understand um, the basics of how to write a function. So um, let's start with the basics. So the learning objectives, um, the way, the best way to understand, I guess, what we're gonna see with these functions is that there are three types of functions, and this is gonna be um, very easy then to recall, right? What exactly it is, it is that I want the output to be, uh, and what it is that I am feeding uh, the function, so that then I can uh, sort of go from there in order to understand how my function is gonna be. Um, built so or created whatever verb it is that goes there so there are three uh, there are three types of functions very basic types which are vector functions which essentially is going to take one or more vectors as an input and then it's going to it's going to return a vector as an output then you have a data frame function which enters a data frame and out comes another data frame and the plot functions um, which take a, takes a data frame, or I suppose a table too, although you know, the difference there, um, and then returns a plot as an output. Okay, so um, functions that are very handy. Why should we learn functions? I suppose it's what this slide is talking about. So essentially, every time you write code that it's more the same code more than once, it becomes um, very obvious that you need a function because that copy paste of the same thing that makes absolutely no sense. So functions are going to automate repetitive tasks like that, like writing the same thing over and over again. Um, it also has a name that makes the purpose very clear. So like the the uh, tidy R verbs like arrange, summarize. So if you write your function with a name that is um, essentially a verb ideally ever, but also if it's just like um, filter, I don't know, something, right? Or you can call it um, summarizing means or something like that. You already know what your function is doing. So it's easier for you to recall, oh yeah, I wrote that function for this or for that. Um, you only need to update the code in one place as things change, which is super handy instead of just going through your entire script. And it's safer than copy and paste because you won't replicate errors, as we're going to see in a little bit. And um, the one thing to remember with functions is that you have to be consistent. And I guess that's that consistency goes um, across. I guess writing code is not just necessarily just for functions. Um, but yeah, let's keep going here. So when and how to write a function, I think. When in doubt, write a function. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, it's it's more. Um, I guess we should be writing more functions than just writing code because it, yeah, like I said, it makes things so much easier. Than once you get it, you get it. But essentially, when you have copy and pasted your code more than twice, is it for a function? Um, when you see that you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, like let's say you're working with a data frame. Uh, or different data frames are doing the same analysis over and over again, and you see yourself going through the same steps, even if you're not copy and pasting the, the code necessarily twice, but it's, you will always start with summarizing, and then you filter these things, and then you over and over and over again do the same thing, uh, consider making a function, right? So key steps in creating a function. First, pick a name that makes it clear what the function does, like summarize or Filter, I mean, don't use those names, right? But I'm just saying that those are very clear names for a function already taken. Don't do, don't use those. But um, but but do something or or use a name that is gonna make it clear for you to remember exactly what the function does. Um, 
then you're going to put, so that's going to be this first part, right? Like the name. Then it's going to have a series of arguments or input variables that go inside that function. And this can be one, two, three, many arguments, right? And then the code, which is the body essentially, that goes inside these curly braces that are here and here, um, that go after you named the function, right? So check your function with a few inputs to make sure it's working, but essentially this is the, the bare bones of a function, right? Like this is exactly how, how you write it. For the all the exercises that we're going to see today, we are going to be using two packages, the tidyverse, of course, and then again with the flights, the NYC flights 13 data base. Not my favorite, but get over that. Um, so let's start with vector functions. Like I mentioned at the beginning, we have three types of functions, and I'm going to start with vector, then I'm going to move to data frame functions, and it, uh, at the end, I'm going to talk about the plot function. The book has a lot of examples of functions, but I'm going to focus on just a few examples to make it, um, because we only have an hour, right? But um, but the book has many, many more examples. I'm just, I just, I'm just using the more relevant ones, I suppose. So let's say we have this table or this data frame that has five different, oh no, four different columns and inside that column, we have some numbers inside. So um, so this is our data frame, like what we're going to start with. It's called DF. Um, this is what it looks like. So we have column A or vector A as, as well. Anyway, it has all of these numbers. Then we have column B or vector B. It has all of these numbers, C and D. Um, and then let's say we want to do this with our data frame. We want to mutate these functions, uh, these uh, columns, so that it's um, essentially we're taking each one of those numbers or each one of those, uh, for each one of those numbers, we want to subtract the minimum of that vector of the entire um, A vector in this case, um, ignoring the NAs in case there were any. And then we're gonna divide it by the maximum uh, number of that vector two minus the mean. So essentially um, this whole operation, we're gonna just repeat it over and over for each one of our vectors. So we're gonna do 0.116 minus the minimum of that vector, in this case it would be zero, right? And then we're gonna divide it by the maximum number. So the biggest number, which would be 0.812 um, minus, the minimum number of that vector, which in this case would be zero. And then with B, the same thing, and C and D. So that's like the first exercise that we have here. But there's a, there's an error here. This is what we want to do. But if you see here, if you come closer, we have A here, and then we repeated the A here again, because that's what we want to do, right? With A here too, and then A, A. So the first one is okay. The second one, However, so we're working with vector B or with column B, and then we are obviously putting BB inside all of this uh, function, but there's an A again here. And that's probably because we usually do because we're repeating the same thing. So we copy this and then we paste it here and then we forget to change one of the values. The rest of them, they do go C, 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 and the last one uses D all across, and that, that one's okay, but this is the first error. So this is exactly what functions do. They prevent us from, because we're copy pasting, right? They prevent us from going, uh, from doing these kinds of mistakes because essentially we're just doing it once. So it's easier to just notice it in one line than in this case with four, right? So let's write that uh, vector function. So to write your function, you have to pay attention to the parts that are constant and the parts that vary. And then that's exactly what you're going to put. Instead of having it, like in this case, right, four lines, we're just going to make it in one into one line. So we see that here, for example, the parts that vary are the A, the B, which are the names of each one of those columns. But the thing that repeats are the 
following functions, right? We want to do the minimum and then we want to divide it by the maximum and subtract it from the uh, subtract minimum from the maximum, I suppose. So those things are constant or are the same that the same things that you're repeating. And the things that are varying are the names of the columns. So to make this a bit clearer, we can replace the bit that varies with, in this case, just this little uh, black rectangle and are the names of the columns. Those are the things that vary. So we have to come up with a way to, um, to create like a, like a universal name for that name for that column but indicating it that it's going to change. The rest, because it's the same thing, we just essentially copy it, right? Like the rest of the functions that don't vary, that are the same, we just copy it there. So to turn this into a function, we need three things. First, it's going to be a name. And because essentially what we're doing here is we're just scaling each one of those, centering and scaling, I suppose. We, uh, that's what we're doing with each one of those vectors. So we're going to name it, name it rescale01. So this function is going to rescale this vector to like between zero and one, and so that we can compare them across, I suppose. And then the arguments are going to be uh, the things that vary. These things that are with the uh, black rectangle. In this case, because we are only have one argument that's going to vary, we're going to just name it x, which is the conventional name for a numeric vector. And then we're going to have the code, uh, the body, sorry, that is the code that's repeated across all the codes, which is the rest that we just saw. So, um, so let's write that function. So we start with the name, rescale01, and then we assign uh, this function x, because this is the only argument that we have uh, for this function. If we had many more of them, we just separate them by commas or with commas. And then we write the body of our function, which is this, and we put the thing that varied, which was our, um, the, the variable that we want, and we're, we're naming that argument as x, and then we copy the rest of the body. And if we use it with, uh, with let's say, this vector, which is minus 10, 0, and 10, we're going to see that it's rescale 0, 1 works great. And then if we use it with a, a vector that has an a's, again, it works really, really well. It's just rescaling the entire um, vector to just make it go between zero and one. And obviously in this case, for example, five is um, the maximum one. So when we rescale it, that becomes one and the minimum one, which is the one, it becomes zero. And the NA just remains as an A because we, and it's not affecting the rest of the operations that we're doing because we make that in the function, right? It says that ignore all the NAs. So let's use rescale one inside a data frame. And again, because each one of the columns are vectors essentially, so we're going to use them with each one of those vectors. So we can use that function inside a mutate, essentially like the thing that we had at the beginning, but instead of writing the entire min, max, blah, 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 we're just going to use our function rescale01. So with data frame, uh, we're initial data frame, then we're going to mutate our column A to be rescaled. Uh, using rescale function 0, 1. And we're going to feed it the vector that we want to rescale, which is A, and then B, and then C, and then D. And now we have a rescaled, uh, each one of our columns are rescaled, and everything works really, really well. However, if you notice here, we are repeating again, rescale 0, 1, rescale 0, 1. We're still repeating some of the code. So there is a way to make this function even more efficient by using across uh, mutate and inside mutate across. But we're going to learn how to do that in chapter 26 with iteration, which is next week. Um, but there's there's this is a good example of how to spot, even though we already created a function, we should be able to spot this repeating things that we're still doing to indicate us, oh yeah, this, this needs to be a function because I'm still repeating something. So there has to be an, a more efficient way um, to create this function or to do this. Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, so other vector functions, another example before uh, we move to something else. 
So here, let's imagine that you have whatever quantity, whatever data frame, it doesn't matter, but you have um, amounts with percent signs, or you have commas, or you have dollar signs. So that those strings, you want to convert them into a number. You want to remove the commas, like let's say you have $10,000. You don't want that value or that cell to have the dollar sign and the comma in the 10,000. You want it to be just a number. So how do you do that? Again, if you create a function, because it becomes super, super easy to then keep using that same function over and over again, every time you come in contact with a CSV file or something that has um, that has percentage or dollar signs or something like that. So I think this uh, this clean number function, and I think that's why we have this uh, Twitter link because I think that it was probably creating created by this person on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, so there are tons of functions that you can find in Stack Exchange Stack. Over, I can never remember the name of that thing, but where we always find answers to all our questions in Stack Overflow, I think it is, Stack Overflow. Uh, Twitter, even on uh, the data science, the, the S DSLC, I can never remember it now with a new name, but the DSLC, um, Slack, we have tons of functions there too. So I guess those are good ways to find out. Anyway, so let's, Let's go over this. So this clean number function, super handy, super easy. I added some comments just to clarify exactly what this is, is doing. So we are just going to feed it. Again, this is a vector, right? We only want to um, either one, just one number or a vector. We want to transform that. So let's keep that in mind. We only have one argument in this case, so it's indicated with x. So that's the only thing that we're going to feed it, which is going to be, again, either a vector or just one number. Um, and then inside that function, first, we're going to detect if there is a percentage in the string. And with that, you we use this, um, this first part of the function, which is is underscore PCT, so is it a percent? So with str detect, which is from string r, uh, it's going to take that number and then it's going to say if it's true or false that it has this sign somewhere in the string. And then once it once that is detected, we move on to the second part of the function, which is let's do this. Um, let's remove all of the dollar sign commas or dollar sign from that number in case there are. So again, with this x, with that number that you have, let's use again the string r package, um, the str remove all function from that S string r package, so that it removes, if there is a percentage, the, that symbol, if, if it's anywhere in the, in the string, remove it. If there isn't, no worries. If there's a comma, remove it. If, it's, if there's a dollar sign, remove it. And in the end, I want it to be a numeric, uh, a numeric transform it essentially from a character or a string to a numeric uh, cell. At this for, uh, and then the last part is if it was a percentage, I don't want it to be 100 or 20 or 33%. I want it to be a proportion like 0 0.33, 0 0.01, right? So that it's easier to then, um, I don't know do anything with that. So if you want to do that, we have the third part of the function, which is with the if else um, function, we feed it the is PCT function, that we, not function, um, object that we had before. So if that was true, then I want you to divide it by 100 and then give me that, right? If it wasn't, if the thing was false, then just give me the number that we had. Let's say it was ten thousand dollars, or I don't know, three or something that it was not a percent. It was just three dollars, or it had just the comma three comma zero zero. Then it's not going to do anything. It's just going to return the number, the same number that we had at the end of this. So let's test it. Maybe I'm over explaining this poor function, but anyway, 
let's test it with this uh, with this example with this twelve thousand three hundred. So let's see. It has a dollar sign and it has a comma, and then when we put it in the function, it removes them. So perfect, it works. Let's try it with a percent. Forty-five percent, great. It returns it as a proportion, which is exactly what we want. So so it works. So we created a function that works. Oh, this is too small here. I'm sorry, but the book was talking about um, a few tips. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit here. Um, a few R Studio tips that are always useful. Because I I love 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 um, keyboard shortcuts. I hate using the mouse. I just I feel like that's <laughs> not efficient. Like you know, you're wasting time moving your hands. Like, but anyway, so these R Studio tips um, that the book has given us is once you start writing functions, there are two R Studio shortcuts that are super useful to find the definition of a function that you've written. Place the cursor on the name of the function and press F2. And that way you're going to be able to find exactly uh, exactly that, right? Like more information about that function. And then the other tip is to quickly jump to a function. Let's say you have a script and you have like 10 different functions, but also all kinds of other things in there. So if you want to jump to a function, just press Control and period or dot. I don't know how you say that to open the fuzzy file and function finder and type the first few letters of your function name. And you can also um, navigate to files, portal sections, and more by making it a very handy navigation tool. I kind of want to test it, but this is a very long chapter, so maybe we can test it at the end. Um, I kind of want to test it now. So I didn't test it yesterday. Um, OK, I think this is. Yeah. In my case, just opens the file uh, browser, the, the drop down. Which, which one? The drop down um, at the, the top. Control, the... Yeah, the control dot. Oh. So it, 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 oh, opens, okay. it opens a drop down to filter the files that are open. Uh -huh. hmm. So that you can find the functions. No. I, I think you have it customized. Mm. Mine does what that says it will do. It says go to file slash function and you type. Let's test it here. And, oh, to... and it shows you like a preview and things that are matches and it shows you where they are. So Okay. Oh, oh go to file function. Okay. Let's see here. I don't remember. Anyways, function. Uh, there was something, uh, yeah, there you go. So if you type and then pause, see it shows the one that's in the. I see this, what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good. Ah, and it jumps. <laughs> yes. But Floris, maybe do you have like a Mac or something? Maybe there. Um, yeah, I was thinking. Up. I was thinking the same. It's on Linux, but I can access it by accessing with Control Shift P. Um, the yeah, how does it? How is it called? Where you can type all commands anyway, which <laughs> are present in menus and and uh, dialogues and etc. And then I can just type go to, and then it pops up at the first as the first uh, hit. So mm -hmm. I can just <laughs> type a little and then control enter, or con uh, press enter, and then uh, I can, uh, I have it, but I cannot access it with control dots. But the control dot is, is actually handy. I just found <laughs> out to, to, to get to the file drop down. <laughs> Maybe they had a, a different preferences for this system. I but, have um so. I have a like a I did it in that PowerPoint. I should do it in Illustrator now, but it's like a little square and I uh printed it and it has all my most used shortcuts and I keep saying this should be like a sticker or something that every time I go to a conference maybe I can give this out or something <laughs> and I keep forgetting to do that. But those shortcuts are so so handy. Um and now I'm gonna add this one. Because, yeah, <laughs> that's good. Esse gatinho gostosinho aqui é meu? I'm sorry? I think, I don't know what that was. I'm getting ready to hop on oh. the official account if I need to. 
Nope. Okay. But I, I just found out it may be because of keyboard mappings. If I do a control semicolon, which on in the Belgian keyboard layout, the dots is with the shifts. So, but so I would have to do yeah. control shift and then that key. But when I do not use a shift and it's actually a semicolon, control semicolon, it opens this one. I'll bet that's, that's what it is. True. Yep. We have to make a note. I'm gonna I'm gonna add that to here and then say this only works on uh, American uh, this, keyboards. Yeah, it might be different depending on your your keyboard settings. Yes, that's it. It's yes. a keyboard. It's a keyboard layout. Uh, yeah, I, I have it with layout. some. Yeah, with some other things as well. If you want to zoom in, the plus is also mm -hmm. assigned with with the shift on a Belgian keyboard. I should not use the shift, so I actually have to use the equal sign. But it's the same key. Oh. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's good. It's good to remember that because we're we're used to um, yeah, American keyboards, and it's not. Universal. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so that yes. should be yeah that should be i'm gonna the, add it to the notes the plus one actually is the same on american keyboards so it's kind of funny it's actually under control equals not under control plus ah it's the same yeah mm -hmm. well yeah hmm. well, I, <laughs> I think it can it can be improved I, I know there are quite a lot of applications that do it correctly, no matter the mm -hmm. keyboard layout. So I think it, it's there's room for improvement here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or the shortcuts should have a name so that when you are looking for them, you can they them. you can customize them. So if you go into yeah, you you can, but uh, it, it's yeah help keyboard shortcuts or help no Some yes yeah, yeah you can oh yeah you can. apply keyboard shortcuts in our studio oh. and you. You can find them and do, yeah. Kind of change anything to anything, basically. Okay. Yeah, that's good <laughs> to know. Oh my gosh, so much to remember. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Okay. Let's continue right. here. So now let's move on to data frame functions. So we just saw an example on vector functions, right? You created a vector. Out comes a vector. And now we're going to do data frame function. So here you feed it a data frame and out comes a data frame. So when you notice yourself copying and pasting multiple verbs multiple times, you might think about writing a data frame function. So data frame functions work like deep layer verbs. They take a data frame as the first argument. Some extra arguments that say what to do with it, like for example, names of columns, uh, and then it's going to return a data frame or a vector. It depends on how you how you have it, but it's an, the majority of times it's going to be like a data frame in data frame out. Unless you want like a summarize and just give me like the mean at the end or something. But anyway, um, one thing to remember one when we're working with functions and the tidy R verbs, we need to remember that, um, or the deep layer verbs, I should say, not the tidy R. I always confuse those two with the deep layer verbs. We need to learn about indirection and tidy evaluation. So what's that? I have an example here for that. So when you start writing functions that use the deep layer verbs, right? Like the group by, summarize, arrange, you rapidly hit the problem of indirection. So let's see an example. So when you have, for example, this function that's called grouped mean, um, that essentially is going to compute the mean of a variable that has been grouped. So you have your function here, you're gonna feed it a data frame, and then you want this group var, which is like the name of a column, and you have another um, column that's called mean var. So those are the three arguments that you have in your function because you wanna do something with these two columns inside the data frame. So we start with the data frame, and then we group the entire data frame by these variables that that's group var. So all the categories that are there, it's going to be grouped. Those are going to group, be grouped. And then we're going to summarize the mean of this column, which is mean var. But when we try to do that, like for example, with the diamonds uh, database that we have by default in R, we run into an error that say most, most no must group by variables found in the data 
and then column root var is not found. So that's the error that it keeps pointing out, and it's so frustrating because you don't understand anything. So what does it mean? It means that uh, that it cannot find this group var column. Like, what is that? Because I cannot find it. In this case, it's called a uh, cut. It cannot find that cut variable or that carrot. Like, it, it's just, it's lost. So that is because, um, and we have the same example here that I'm not going to go through, but um, it's essentially because of this, the problem of indirection. And it arises because dplyr uses tidy evaluation to allow you to refer to the names of variables inside your data frame without any special treatment. So you have to do something to indicate that this is the name of the variable. This is exactly what I want, not necessarily um, something else that I want you to look for. So then let's see how to solve for that. So the tidy evaluation makes of data analysis very concise as you never have to say which data frame a, variables, a variable comes from. But the downside comes when we want to wrap up repeated tidyverse code into a function. So we have to do this, this thing called embracing. And it becomes super clear once we see it. So embracing just means that you have two curly brackets at the beginning and at the end of a variable, of the name of a variable. So let's do this again. So we have this function called grouped mean, and this function is going to have the following arguments, the data frame that you're feeding it, the group var, that's going to be one of the columns, and then the mean var is going to be another one of the columns. So it doesn't matter what these things are called. Like they can, it doesn't really matter because we're going to put them inside these curly brackets. So we're going to say with the data frame, then we're going to group it by this variable, and then we're summarizing it by the mean of whatever it is that it's in here. And obviously, the names are the same here, and the names, these two names are also the same. So if we do with our data frame, and then we use the function grouped mean, and we're saying that the first thing that I need you to use to group by is this column called group. And then I want you to summarize the mean of my X column. So then that's exactly what it's grabbing, right? Because they can be named anything. It doesn't really matter as long because you put them in here. You could put here X and Y. And because you put them in curly brackets, it's going to know that whatever it is that you put here at the beginning and at the end, as long as it's, the names are the same in the curly brackets and in the arguments, it's going to grab those variables. It's going to understand that this is exactly what I need to do. So this is super, super useful for many, many reasons. Let me go forward. But we need to understand when to embrace or when to use this curly bracket. Right, like when do I put curly brackets and when can I just skip it and just Put the name of the variable inside here without worrying about this embrace. So the key challenge in writing data frame functions is exactly understanding which of those arguments need to be embraced. And uh, the two terms that we need to sort of understand here is something called data masking and tidy selection. So data masking is used in functions like arrange, filter, and summarize that are going to compute variables, like new variables that are going to compute with variables, I suppose. And then tidy selection, is, it just means that it's going to use functions like select, relocate, or rename, that it's just going to select variables. It's just going to take them out. It's not doing anything with those variables. Um, just picking them up. So let's see an example of when to use this and when not to use it. So let's say we have this function called summary text. And in that function, we're going to feed it a data frame. We're going to call it data. And then we have a variable. Those are going to be my two arguments. So then let's do with data, with the data frame. Then we're going to summarize all of these things that we usually go 
used to summarize the data frame, which is going to be the minimum value, the mean, the median, the maximum, the number of items, and the number of NAs that, that we also have in that data frame. And uh, the other thing that it's important to remember that every time we use group by or summarize, because essentially summarize is also grouping by, every time we use those functions inside a function, it's good practice to end that function with the dot groups equals drop, which is essentially the uh, to remember to ungroup whatever it is that we grouped so that the result is not grouped, right? So that we are not dealing with grouped data once it comes out. So here we put inside each one of these functions because they're inside the summarize, right? We embrace them. So here we know then that we're going to compute, we're going to do something to change that variable. That's why it has to be in the embrace. If, it, if we were just selecting, then we wouldn't have to worry about this. So let's see here, for example, if we use with the data frame diamond, and then we, um, with the column carrot, we just want to summarize that column from the diamond's data frame, then this caret is essentially what's going to be inside these curly brackets, right? But we already know that because this is, like I said, this could be x, this could be var, this could be variable one, whatever name it is, it doesn't matter. You just put it inside the bracket and you put it in the argument and then the function understands that it's, that that's what you're trying to do. And then you have your summary of all of the, uh, of all that, of uh, of the carrot column. And then if you want to group it by cut, for example, let's say because the cut, um, that data frame has uh, these categories of cut, if the diamond is fair, if it's good, if it's premium uh, diamond, then if you want to group it by that and you want the summary to be for each one of those uh, categories for the variable cut, then you can group that, right? You essentially put the group by cut first, and then you do the, the summary with your summary six function. And then that's exactly what you have here. In the end, for each one of your categories of cut, you have the minimum, the mean, the median, the maximum, right? So let's look at an example where we compare data masking and tidy selection. So essentially when to embrace, but not to embrace. So if you want to select variables inside a function that uses data masking, you can work around that error by using the handy pick function. And uh, this pick function, I had no idea that it existed, and now it makes a lot of sense because you are not, you, that sort of, it makes it easier, I guess, to, to work with variables inside a function. So let's say you have this count missing function that you created, and this function has three arguments. Again, your data frame that you're studying with, and then you have the first column and the second column that you want to work with. So what you want to do with this is, again, you want to summarize some of those columns, and you want to do um, the number of NAs that are inside this X var column, but first you grouped it by a column, which in, in this case is going to be group bars. But if you do it like this, if you are embracing both of the um, variables or names, it's going to give you an error when we use it with the flights, um, with the flights data frame, because it's going to tell you that for example, let's say here, you want to count the missing, because that's the name of the function, but right, count the missing, but you want it to be group, you want it to group it year, month, and day, and then the one that you want to count the NAs is from the departure time, but you want to group it by these three um, arguments, and you think, well, this is super easy because I just have to put all of those Right, like that's my group variables. It should be okay. There's not going to be an issue here, but it turns out that it is because that group by 
is using data masking. It's not using tidy selection. So be, to avoid that, we're going to use the pick function so that it remembers to pick whatever it is that you're going to put inside that group variables. So that pick function is going to work around this problem, and it's super, super easy. Um, I don't remember. Pick comes from what package, I suppose. Maybe it's part of the tidyverse. I'm not sure. But when we... I think, it's for, from, I think it's from the per package. Uh, I think it, it's... Yeah. Um, no, I know, but no, I think it's dplyr. It's it's next to across. Yeah, uh, it's dplyr. Yeah, yeah. I, I was ah. um, confusing with plug, but um, yeah. Uh, perhaps I just want to add that uh, the em yeah. I think the yeah right, the embracing. It's yeah. I think it's it's typical for the tidy evaluation in general. So both for the mm -hmm. data masking and for the the tidy the tidy selection. Uh, it's just that you need to pick inside the data masking function if you want to select variables with a yeah with a tidy select expression like the C, which is happening here. If you wouldn't uh, use the C in that count missing function, it would not be a problem. Yeah, if you only had year, for example. Yeah, it for example. Be a problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the problem is because you want to pick <laughs> several <laughs> functions, several columns to go inside that group by. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That's, what, that's how I understood it, right? So yeah. pick whatever is inside that section. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I forget. I forgot where I was. But anyway, <laughs> essentially, once we use that pick function inside that function that we just created, then we um, the function understands that what it's going to do is it's going to group it by all of this um, variable and then the summarize there's no problem here right this is that one it was just with the group by okay so now with plot function but this data masking on the tidy selection just before i move on it's already 245 um or 144 in chicago I suppose. this data masking on the tidy selection it once you get it like it makes so much sense but it takes you a little bit to understand it. So I think the best way that, that at least for me to understand it or to remember this is that some of the verbs, it's this part right here. Some of the verbs are going to do data masking and the other ones, like when you just want to select a variable and it's going to be super easy, then they do the tidy selection. So I think at least that helped me a little bit. Yeah. Anyway, it's moving on. It, mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, you do the data masking if you care about the data, if you care about the actual values, versus the tidy selection is if you only care about the name. Like I want the column that is named MPG or named cut or named whatever. And you don't really care what's in that column or whatever you're gonna do. Versus like if you're mutating, obviously you care about the contents. And so that's a data mask situation. Select, doesn't matter what's in the column, you're selecting that column as a whole. So it's yeah. but it's always or it still can be confusing <laughs> oh yeah i catch myself doing the wrong way some from time to time yeah oh well good to know it's <laughs> not just me <laughs> <laughs> okay so then for plot function so again so plot functions means that you're going to input a data frame and return a plot there are i think this is because of my work, this is the mo my most used type of function that I do, but I guess it, I've, I've done all of them, I suppose, at some point. But anyway, so with these plot functions, um, we have to remember that the aesthetics that are inside mapping are going to use data masking. So this is, this is super important so that we know how to um, when to embrace or when not to embrace. So with the diamonds, let's continue with the diamonds data frame. So we want to create a ggplot. We want to create a specific, specifically a histogram with the uh, column caret. 
So then we, uh, oh yeah, these two things are just, I don't know why I didn't print the graphs here. I think I, I must have removed the result. I mean, I don't know. But anyway, so this is exactly what, uh, what you want to do. You're just comparing two different histograms with different bin widths. So again, we're copying the same thing twice, time for a function. So instead of just having it like that, we can just create our histogram function. Um, just make sure that name is not already another function in base or something like that, in base R or whatever other package that you're using. And then this function is gonna use the following argument. So we have a data frame, we have a column, whatever it is, and then there's an argument inside one of those functions that we want it to be uh, null. So we want this argument to be, in this case, it's the one inside the geom histogram. And we are just saying that by putting it like this, it just means that you are going to put a number whenever you evaluate that function or you use that function. So in this case, it's just null so that it doesn't recognize a zero, a one, a two, a three, so that you can then put the number that you want. So that's why it says null there. Essentially, it's just empty, but we're gonna use it in the future. So the function, again, is just feeding it the data frame, and then you're gonna create a ggplot. And inside that ggplot, you're putting the aesthetics of what your x is gonna be. And again, because the AES or the aesthetics uses that data masking, we have to embrace that variable. So in this case, whatever variable we want, we just named it var inside the curly bracket. And then we do the, the geom histogram, which is what we want to do. And the bin width equals bin width because we are going to name exactly what that bin width is going to be. Essentially, this is just saying bin width equals null. So diamonds, then histogram, the um, the variable that we want is caret, which is this var, and then the min width is going to be 0.1, and then lo and behold, here it is. Um, oh yeah, and then because it's using ggplot2, you can then customize it and do whatever it is that you want to do just by adding more um, ggplot functions, like labs, theme, scales, whatever it is that you want to do, just remember to use the plus sign except uh, instead of the pipe. Okay. So what happens if you have more than one variable that you want to include in a plot? So let's see an example here. Again, this came from Tyler J. Smith's Twitter. I suppose so that's why the Twitter is there. I never follow that um, hyperlink. I never checked it, so I don't. I, I'm assuming that. But anyway, this linearity check function, what it's gonna do is gonna uh, check if my data is um, linear by overlaying a smooth line and a straight line. So it's it's just um, using two different types of um, checking two different types of um, what is this thing called, um, methods to evaluate the linearity of my function. So in the, of my data, not my function. So let's go through the function and understand what this is doing. So we have function here that has three different arguments, the data frame that we're feeding it. And then we have two variables that we're going to use inside our, uh, our plot, which are going to be X and Y. Again, you can name them whatever, but just remember that those names have to be inside the, the body of the function too. So with the data frame, then we're going to do a ggplot with the aesthetics of x equal x, and that one needs to be embraced because, again, the aesthetics uses tidy evaluation. And then the y equals y in for double curly brackets are embraced. And then we're going to create a geom point so our scatter plot here. Then we're going to do the geom smooth uh, to create the first one with using the method 
Lowest, I think that's how you pronounce it. And then the formula again is going to be yx. It's going to be with the color red and um, not including the standard errors uh, around the function. So we don't want that. I suppose we could also put the uh, colors in here as part of the argument. Um, so we color one, color two, instead of putting the colors inside the function. But anyway, that's besides the point. And then the other GeoSmooth is gonna do, do the same thing, but with the uh, linear model uh, method. So then let's check these two, uh, these two functions with the Star Wars data frame. First, let's filter the mass of the objects that are less than a thousand, I think it's kilograms. I don't remember, but less than a thousand, let's say kilograms. So I'm only gonna use um, smaller objects from this Star Wars um, data frame. And then I'm gonna check the linearity of two variables, which are gonna be mass and height. No, did I explain that correctly? I am going to associate those two variables See if the height depends on the math. I guess that's a better way to describe it. And then I'm gonna see if the data follows a linear trend or if it doesn't follow a linear trend. I guess that's a better way to describe it. Anyway, how are these two variables associated? Maybe that's a better way to describe this. Are they associated using a linear pattern, a linear trend or not? All right, so this is exactly what your function is doing. It's creating the linear function with the blue um, with the blue line. And I guess a legend here would have been very useful, I guess, but they didn't add it. So again, one thing that you can do at the end, plus, um, because it's a GeoPlot, right? Like plus, um, theme, legend, blah, blah. So that's, a, that's one way of including several variables inside function um, and some arguments, right, when you're trying to create a function. Um, what was this one? Oh, so this is creating a function with, so creating a plot, but using inside the function, not just a ggplot component, but also like deep layer verbs or something like combining with other tidyverse, combining different uh, so ggplot with um, tidyverse and then maybe deep layer verbs or something like that, right? Like it's, this is what we're uh, doing here. The, this example introduces a new operator called the wal walrus operator. I can never say that. Walrus operator which is essentially a colon and then an equal sign. And this behaves, this operator behaves exactly like an equal sign, but every time we're working with a function that uses uh, tidyverse verbs, you don't wanna use that equal sign, but you wanna use the walrus operator. Uh, don't know why I put a minus here. This should be an equal sign, I think. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yes, I, I, yeah. I think it should be an equal sign. I think the specific thing is that at the left-hand side, you can use this embracing approach. So to do the tidy evaluation for the variable that is in the, at the left-hand side of the equal sign. That, uh, that's what it allows to do, the walrus sign. Yeah, you can put something, mm -hmm. basically the left-hand side gets evaluated before it decides what to assign to when you use the walrus, which normally you can't do that with an equal sign. And so it, it processes it and then assigns something to it. So, so the walrus um, operator, sort of like um, fix 
the start so that it can evaluate it, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, it makes equal work in a fancier way. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay. So what we're doing here is just saying that this, uh, where we're using this walrus operator, is just to say that with this part of the function, the mutate bar. So not the mutate. Inside the mutate, we have a variable, which is the one that we're feeding here as an argument. And that's going to be equal to all of these things that you're doing here. You're um, doing, this is from uh, cats, right? For cats, I think. These are functions yes. from for yes. cats. Yep. I don't know much about for cats. And that's the one <laughs> of those packages that I always say I need to learn, but I don't know. I know that it works with factors. So I'm really so not sure exactly what's happening here with that. But it's, all I know you is can mostly just read it. So it's fact rev is factor reverse. So it's going to reverse okay. whatever it's getting. And then fact in freak is getting, it's finding the infrequent. So it would be sorting by infrequent levels. And then when you reverse that, you therefore are sorting by frequent levels. Of um, that variable. But so this could also be like a, let's say, mean of bar. Instead of having all of that. If yeah, like if you mean, want to do something else. Yep. Yeah. Whatever function it is, essentially the walrus operator here is just saying if this variable that we're feeding here, right? Let's like say this was um clarity. So clarity is going to be equal to the mean of clarity. If yep, or, or whatever else you want to do. Yeah. Exactly. So that's that's exactly how you use this operator. The rest is exactly the same with this function. Just um, a fancy way to use equal inside a function when you're working with tidyverse first or tidyverse syntax. And then this is the resulting plot that you get, which is going to be just your, I guess that's what it was doing, sorting the factors, this factor so that it's, um, so that they're ordered right. I think that's yep. What this all of this is doing, but those for yeah. cats, for cats will yeah. get me. And this time, yeah. Anyway, uh, oh, moving on to fifty nine. So labeling, um, this is kind of cool because it's using Rlang, um, the package Rlang, which will always get a lot of love from me because it's super cool. But anyway, hmm. it's using the nglue function that. Um, so what is that? What, why are we using this? So um, in glue works similarly to string glue. So any value wrapped inside these curly brackets is going to be inserted into the string. So this is super cool because let's say we want to, um, in this case, we want the plot to have all of this. A histogram of carrot with pin width 0.1. We want that title. Right, like it's it's a whole string. We wanted that as a title in our ggplot. So we're going to create that label, that label for our title by using this nglue function, which I love and I always forget to use. But anyway, it's going to be the text that we have a histogram of with bandwidth, bandwidth. The thing that we have here, those arguments, we put them in here inside curly brackets, and then it's going to change them every time we use a different variable. So here, for example, if we were using clarity, histogram of clarity, we just put here clarity, clarity and a different bandwidth. And that's going to be also in the title. Like it's going to be changing every time we change the, um, the arguments. I think that's super, super cool. So this is um, like paste zero, I suppose, but it allows us to use um, the the functions that are in our the arguments that are in our function with the embrace. Um, and then the rest is exactly the same thing that we've been seeing. So no need to explain that again. Um, making functions readable. So these are just a few uh, tips on how to make this uh, how to make functions in general readable. So be consistent in your naming and coding of functions. And that could be for example if you're uh, Functions, if you are really working with verbs, then 
like your function is doing something, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, then those functions should have a verb in the name. Your arguments should be nouns, like people, place, or sort of things. Uh, be consistent in using snake case or camel case. Um, for sets of functions, use a common prefix. Don't overwrite existing functions, like create a new function, right? Like to not overwrite it. Uh, use comments to explain the why of the code. That's very important. And then use lines of, uh, use different lines to break up code into sections so that it's not just one single line, right? Like it's, you have it uh, a little separated by plus sign. I think this should be a plus sign. <laughs> I don't know why. I didn't change that. I'm sorry. Um, so if uh, it's ggplot, right? Like separated by plus. Sign. It's no, it yeah. was. It was Normally, the thing to do is you do like here. Let me put it in the chat. Something. Oh, yeah. that's not what I'm. Let's see. Ah, I can't do it because it is treating uh ast or the hash as a special character in chat. But I can do it on um in you Why know do in I the Slack. Here? Um, it's it's right as is. <laughs> so oh, it's right as is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can. You know, if I put a quote. There we go. So you put or, so a line like that or a line like that in your code. Um, oh, to the section. And R2 goes, sees them as separate or as special things. In co you know, it'll be different in R Markdown versus not R Markdown. Yeah. Um, but you, so you guess... can, it, it puts like dividers in. Kind of like how we you have the outline here. It'll do an outline. Yeah. Like it doesn't. It's not gonna work here. Like yeah, this. This like is what that. you're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So this title. Ah, I didn't know what that that was. What it what it meant. Yeah. The other one that you put here was this one. Yeah. Yeah, and there's Come another again. one too. I forget what it is, but I think it's um. It, it uses this like vertical bar. And then what it does is create um, sub themes. So it's gonna just like um, tab this second one, this thing that I have here, but I always forget how to do it. I think something like that. I don't know. I have it in my scripts. I think this is about, I think this is about our scripts, not about Markdown, right? Yes. Yeah, this is specifically yeah. for our so, scripts. Yes, so that's Control Shift R, which I put in the chat. Yes. If you do it in an R Studio, it's to insert a section in an R script, yeah. and then it, it it asks you a title, and then it will um, add the section in such a string of uh, a hash and dashes or uh, equal signs. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh. And just, then you can uh, use the number of um, pound signs make subsections. So if you do pound sign and then a word and then, or control shift R, whatever, um, that makes, oh, not that. Control shift R is not the same for me because that's going to load things. But anyway, oh, I have that configured. Anyway, so if you do that, the, the single hash, single up pound signed, that's like top level header. And if you do two, it'll make a subheader. Three, it'll make a subheader. And all of this is just so that the, well, it does make it easier to read, but especially it creates an outline in our studio that you can use to navigate yeah. the code. For your scripts. Like, yep. yeah, that's, a, now, that's actually a good. Um, like, usually I prefer to split it up into logical pieces so there's not too much within one file, but there are still times when that can be, you know, really useful. Yes. It was in huh. chapter four, yes, I know. <laughs> All my scripts funny. have this, and yeah, I do I, try I, to. I think the subsections yeah. were not uh, there. I think that yeah. was a new, a new thing. The subsections. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So excellent. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do. Yeah, that's a, that's for scripts. It's always like it's a it's an organized way to have your outline that you created with hashtags. Um, also in Markdown, right? But your title, subtitle. Um, yeah, one thing I've seen, but I think this is maybe old school or something. I see a lot of people do this. 
Uh, yeah. Here, title. Oh, sorry. Hashtag. You have to do yeah. And then they do this. I hate that, but I suppose this is. I don't know how it used to be before. The there, in some languages, that has a specific meaning, and then it also it just it, it's usually used for like a big header that you're really trying to set off, like you know, one at the top of a file where you've got copyright information or something like that, you know, a real important piece that you're trying to set apart. Um, I still, I don't know. I don't think I've used that in any time recently, but I can understand that there are use cases where you want to make just a really kind of bright box, like really draws the eyes. I don't like it because I feel like flutters. Flutters, do you like that? Do you use it? I do use it sometimes in very long scripts because it's much more conspicuous. Yeah. Actually, I didn't know about the sectioning comments before I read <laughs> this, but uh, I was used to the old school uh, habit. And so oh. you have different kinds of conspicuousness. <laughs> Another really useful thing about the sectioning comments in mm -hmm. our studio is they get a little uh, triangle thingy so you can collapse them. And so oh, yeah. if you have really long scripts, that's a nice way to kind of just get stuff out of the way piece by piece. Um, yeah. Oh. That's why I don't like doing it like that. Okay. Then, yeah, yeah you start from writing here. Whatever. It is interesting then, to yeah. see that it sees the line of hashes as a collapsing thing. Like, you know, lines one and three. Yeah, but that yeah. may be subsection, subsection level 26 or something. Yeah, oh yeah it probably <laughs> is. <laughs> subsection 80. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's funny. <laughs> it yeah. almost certainly is. My uh, advisor, my, my PhD advisor, he didn't use this part that much. He usually used this one. I think it was him or one of my professors in my PhD, I don't remember. But they use this this bottom part more than the outline. I guess it's the same thing, right? I use this. Yeah, the outline just displays all of it all the time, versus the one at the bottom is just to jump to a place. Right. Yeah, I, I forget the one at the bottom things. exists. Yeah, <laughs> the we all we all use our um our studio differently, right? So yeah. many things. Um, let me see if I have something else. Just as the final summary, but I think we already went there and then there's all the videos. So I think that's it. I mean, it's 309 or 209 <laughs> in Chicago. I have three more questions, but I guess there's no more time. Um, but yeah, so I can ask them in the Slack channel, um, but, that's, but that's it. That's it. That's all I have. At the end of the of the chapter. Thank you, Gabby. Mm, no, thank you, guys. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. All right. Well, I will see you on Slack. <laughs>